Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to episode 87 of Get Out of Rap. Today, I am joined by Sandria Morgan, who is the Senior Community Experience Manager at Depop. Hi, Sandria. Hello. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you, too. And um, we were just talking before hit and record about what a lovely, I just love that title, community mm. experience. It's its not something you see very often, is it? It's not. Um, but at Depop, it's about the whole community. So it's our users. So the 30 million users that are on the platform um, and, and the community at Depop, which is all of our people. So our customer services agents, our managers, um, all of the, the engineers, everybody that makes Depop what it is. That is the community. And what is Depop for those that don't know? It's a fashion marketplace, but the, the target market is slightly younger people. Um, so before they approached me about the role, I had not heard of them because I've just turned 40. So I'm definitely not the demographic, the, the, the target demographic <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's a real, it's a, I would, I would call it Instagram meets eBay. So lots of young people communicating to, um, about the product that they want to buy. Um, so you would go into the app, upload your, your item, somebody could like it, you would then start having a conversation, you buy it or you choose not to buy it because of whatever reason. The real focus is that community feel, so it's not just about the product, it's about people connecting together and, and making deep up what it is. So we follow the community trends rather than, I guess, just buying lots of stock and sticking it on the website. It's what's going on, it's what young people want to wear. Um, and that's what makes it different and special, it makes it unique actually. I love that. I guess it means um, you can be agile because how quickly trends change or Absolutely. what people are interested in changing, yeah. you're sort of seeing it live, I guess, are you? Yeah. So it's it's all young people, that, you know, so it's 90% of the platform is, is, is under 26. So it's people who are buying um, items, wearing it once or twice, and rather than throwing it away and, and wasting uh, or buying something new, they're just going, right, I'm just going to sell it or swap, you know, and, and we encourage that behavior because we want people to, um, to waste less and be greener. Right. And so Depop's fundamentals are around sustainability, inclusion, diversity, celebrating young people, making young people entrepreneurs in, in a slightly different way. I, I big ticks for all of those, I think. if And if you haven't got that as a, uh, the, the foundation through what you do, then you'll miss that, that demographic just isn't going to be interested, are they? Yeah. And it, it makes, it's our differentiator, you know? Um, you can go on to other marketplaces, but the experience is completely different. We are definitively targeting a younger audience who are slightly trendier, a bit more street. There's lots of like old school fashion. It's very, very vintage. So there's real diversity and that's a great word. It's a, we have diversity in terms of our user goals. So just the stuff you can find on Depop is very, very different. I love that, right. Now let's find out a little bit more um, about you. How have you got to this place right, that you are right now? How have I got to this place? So <laughs> I went into my first contact center environment in 2002 um, and it was outsource environment and it was old school outsourcing, you know, so lots yeah. of big accounts, you have lots of people to manage um, and it was accounts that you know I would just not put together now if I was running an outsource environment but for me I remember I started as an agent I had a charity contact customer that I could be handling I had a, a subscription delivery service I had payday loans like it was a real mixed bag <laughs> yeah. now you just wouldn't do that to an agent would you but it was for yeah me. um and just really progressed through that so I started as an agent supervisor account manager then did quality assurance Spent about three years there, then another two years in another outsourcer, then went into another outsourcer where I did public sector outsourcing, which is slightly different because actually the, the drive is different. I think in, in lots of private sector organizations, it's about margins and profit. In that environment, it really was a lot more about the customer. And my customer in that case was housing repairs. And I can't tell you what doing or handling a housing repairs account um, is like, you know, especially in winter in public sector housing stock, that's not in great condition. So it was actually as a, as a manager, I would say probably my most challenging role because I couldn't, you can't just go, oh, 
here's x pounds to apologize for the experience that you've had or something like that it's someone who hasn't had heating for for three weeks and you still can't get someone out to them that is really hard to do and teaching agents and supporting agents to handle that kind of query was really hard um i've and seen then, some of that oh sorry go on no, 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 uh, no. i was just going to say i've seen some of the um housing sector i spent some time with those um those guys and it's like you say it's because it's someone's home it it's super and naturally so right but it's super emotive yeah and that kind of how did you how do you help your teams kind of deal with the the emotion of residents ringing in and you know yeah. going so i think firstly for me it's about helping them to understand how much control they have within that so how can you support this person how can you calm them down and help them to understand you're going to do the best you can to support them help them to understand the rules that mean that the job that they think is important because they're quite cold in their home is not as important as the elderly person who's in their home without heating and that's why their job isn't going to happen as quickly as they would like it to so really giving them the tools to have that conversation with with that customer um but also to be able to even if that phone call is really difficult step away after the call and go right I've done the best I can I'm upset I'm going to go for a walk or take a break and actually that's something I still I do now at Deep Pop because we have a a different type of customer who who goes through a difficulty and you still need to take that break. So it's in all CX environments. If you get a really difficult call, do the best you can, support the, the customer as best you can. Um, and then if you need to just take a moment for yourself and talk to a colleague, make a joke about something, go get a cup of tea. Or if it's really bad at, at Depop, we've got um, support structures in place for, for, for the agents if they've had a really tough contact that they have to deal with. Um, so so yeah I, I left that um company and went to my first um sort of client side or if you want to call it that because I, I thought we would call it an outsourcing um and I went to, to Charles Turret and I, I was there for eight years um and I think I would say that's the point I started understanding who I really was and I think that's a really important thing in CX because in CX you tend to just you know, an opportunity comes up, if you've got the skills, people know actually, you know what, Andrea is really great at A, B and C, I apply for the role, I was generally quite successful at that. And at CT, I was able to just be me. And so I, yeah. could, I could do the bits that I don't really enjoy. And I could say that here, I don't like spreadsheets, I don't like lots of documents and stuff like that. <laughs> you know <laughs> I love talking to, to people, mm. either customers or, or agents or our teams and really figuring out what their challenging are, challenges are, what they love, what they enjoy, helping them to do more of that, but fixing the bits that are broken. Um, and I saw at CT, I had colleagues who were really great at the other stuff. So I could just concentrate on the, the bits that I love. And I did that um, for, for, like I said, eight years, but then the COVID hit and Charles Tirrett for the, I was saying CT, but it's Charles Tirrett, which is a menswear retailer, um, formal retail. Um, so you can imagine what happened to that in when COVID hit. Um, yeah. And so we went through a really tough time. I was really lucky in that I found um, a role at Depop straight away um, after that happened. But but yeah, I became me. So, um, but it got even better at Depop in that at Charles Turret, I was um, seen a customer services manager. And here, uh, yes, I have that kind of broad title, but my my actual role is focused on training and quality. Um, and so I get to take the juicy quality data, which tells me what people are getting wrong and what they're getting right um, and do something with it. So it's not it doesn't just go on to a report every week. It's like, right, what are, what are the real pain points for users? What are the real pain points for agents? What can we do about it? What are we doing really well that we can teach those five agents over there are struggling? Who can we get to do some peer to peer coaching with them to to share that good practice? So I, I get to focus on, on that part of CX, which I really enjoy. Love and that. That's kind of where I am now. I love it. There's so much to, <clears throat> excuse me, unpack there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I wanted to ask you was, you know, when um, you were that agent for the first time, mm -hmm. handling multiple kind of uh, accounts in different sectors, thinking, yeah. what, what's all this about? <laughs> yeah. Um, why? why stay in the industry what was the what was the moment or why why think oh i'm gonna i'm gonna stay here and progress mm. i think 
what I, I mean, I've always worked really hard. I'm quite disciplined, um, but I, I connect with people. So I think in, in customer service and contact center roles, it's about two groups of people, for me anyway. So it's about your customer. So I could really, I can turn someone's day around, no matter what that phone call is about, you know, if it's a, a beauty product or, a, you know, they're calling to donate to a charity or their paper hasn't turned up, how I communicate with that person can change their day. They might not like the conclusion because you don't always give people exactly what they want, but you can lift someone. Um, and I guess I've stayed because I could, I could also have an impact. So not just with customers, with, with, with agents, with my colleagues. I feel like customer service and contact centers, we're real communicators. We mm. talk about how we're feeling. We, we, we talk about the customer, about making things better. I think that's what's kept me in it. I love I'm, that. I'm in a space where I can make things better all the time. I love that. I think um, I know a manager for me once when I was an agent said, uh, you can help people have a spring in their step when maybe they're not expecting it. So yeah. we were, I think, I can't remember what it was. It was in financial services. Let's say it's insurance. It's a bit pretty, pretty dry. Yeah. But if you have a nice phone call and you're appreciating where that customer's call to you is in their day. Mm -hmm. So trying to think about your own life and go, it's a task. So you go, oh, I've got to ring the bank. It's yeah. never, it's never, oh, brilliant. I've got to ring the bank. But you, yeah. you have the opportunity to actually make that a pleasant experience. Absolutely. And it makes it pleasant for you too. If you've got to do 50, 60 of those a day, depending on what type of account you're on, you helping that person to enjoy it helps you too. And yeah, so for me, I do try and get get agents to understand that, team leads to understand that so that, you know, that they can have that conversation in their coaching session. It is turning someone's day around just by keeping your own energy up. Um, yeah, so I, I completely get that. But I love like that you... analogy, the spring in the step. I might steal that, Martin. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, it seems to me then that you've been, you've got this sort of passion about um, contact centers, CX. Yeah. And that kind of, you've, the word that comes to mind about you is like you're driven mm -hmm. to, um, is that, is it through wanting to constantly be, creative and keeping your mind going or is it about thinking about the impact that you personally can have that's made you go to different roles and it's definitely um about impact for me so I over the last I would say five or six years have I got divorced which is a big life thing the other thing about me hey. as I should say <laughs> is that I'm from a tiny island called Montserrat in the Caribbean and I came to London when I was 15 um and one of the things that that does to you when you have that such a big transition, because it happened because we had an active volcano and loads of wow. people had to evacuate. And what I know now about myself is that I'm quite resilient and I deal with change really well. Um, but I'm also someone who's quite, I'm clear that I want to have a positive impact. So that's on people, that's on the planet. And so when I look at my job day to day and the sort of direction of my life, I want to be doing good things that are impactful. Um, and that's about being clear about who I am and what I bring, but also about my, helping my teams to do that. So on a, on a kind of daily basis, I'm being that person. And when you're, when you're living with such clarity, I think, and acting with such clarity, it really helps you to, to just take the right steps and make the right decisions about where you want to go, who you want to present yourself to be on either LinkedIn, because I, you know, Deepop reached out to me about this role because of who I was presenting myself to be to the world, you know? So that is also equally important because I'm in a place that cares about all of the, the, the things that matter to me. So having an impact on the planet, diversity and inclusion, um, having, having women in, in senior roles so that I've got someone to look up to, you know, that is a big part of what Depop is about. So I, I've ended up, if you want to put it that way, in a place that completely connects with who I am. Um, so important and that's something I'm so grateful for yeah mm, that's amazing I love that um because it, it, it talks about you talk about self-awareness isn't it and it's not that it's a I, I only read a book about it a few years ago and it kind of like was a epiphany mm. just around self-awareness is a superpower so mm. it, when you talk about how you present yourself to the to the world and mm. what that is and then through that you can really understand what's important to you yeah. Um, it's I, I love what you said. What was 
what was it like as a 15 year old completely having it's such um, a change in life so I I was super good in school in Montserrat like top of my class pretty consistently there was me and one other girl who always battled it out and <laughs> um, it's a tiny nemesis when I say tiny, I mean, the population was 10,000 before the volcano. So you're in classes with, you know, you know, 15, 20 people. So it's tiny, you know, everyone. And I came to London, I was, you know, I went into classroom twice the size, people swearing at teachers. I remember my first day at college, um, somebody got stabbed. You know, it was just, it was pretty traumatic, but I didn't realize how bad it was. Cause you know, at that time in your life, you're, you're a kid, you just kind of bounce along with it. But over that period, so over the next five years or so, I would say, you know, I put on like five or six stone. Um, my relationship with my family changed. I, I wasn't that sort of head down girl anymore. And what happened, I think I was really lucky to have parents who kind of pulled me back into line, but I also had an A-level law teacher who got me involved in, in politics actually. So yes, we were in classroom talking about the law, but he also got me involved in anti-racism demonstrations, demonstrations about saving the planet, LGBTQ plus issues. I was doing that stuff like super, like really early. Yeah. And it kind of made me realize that there's more to life than me. And there's, if, if you want to be a kind of good person, there is, yes, you take care of yourself, but actually if you are actively taking steps to support others and help them grow, it helps you. And he really turned my life around. And that then meant that I was a confident communicator because when you're on demonstrations on a Saturday with people you don't know, you just you just start chatting to people. And I, I grew out of my community. So I went from a, a place in North London where I only saw people who generally looked like me, spoke like me, to a place where I was being exposed to lots of different people from lots of different places. Um, and it just showed me there was more to life. And, and that really, I think, turned things around for me. I, I love that. Absolutely love it. My degree was in um, politics. And I think, actually, I changed when I first got to uni. And I can't say it was because I was like massively politically driven. Yeah. It was actually I got an extra week's holiday. So, um, <laughs> but I, I learned from that. And I I went the other way around. I only started going on demonstrations and things mm. in my th in my thirties, and um, I I just love that idea of the impact. Again, it's about that word, isn't it? It's about the impact that that teacher had and just kind of opening your mind mm. and saying get passionate about things. Do you still do you still do things? Do you still, I am, you still yeah. active? I, I was, I was up until like a few weeks ago, um, a, a women's officer for a political party. I won't say which one because I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> go down that road. Um, but um, I stepped down because actually I've started volunteering as a board trustee for a domestic violence charity. Um, and I don't do things by halves. So I wanted to make sure I could give all of that energy um, to the new board trustee role. But yeah, I'm still involved in politics. I still deliver leaflets on a weekend um, because I do believe that we all need to be a part of the change, no matter what party you're in, because I'm not one of those who believes that it's one way or the other. I think what I've learned over the years is that diverse thinking, be that politically or just around <laughs> financials, if you're in a business, you know, all of that stuff diverse thinking really makes a difference. So I'm quite happy to sit around the table with people from all sides to make the right decision. Um, Cause that in the end is about, is how you're gonna really create good change. If everybody in the room has the same perspective and point of view, you can get locked into decisions that are wrong because nobody really thought outside of that box. Um, so so yeah, I'm still involved and I still still really care about it. Do you can I ask you like <laughs> this is going off on a tangent, but I really love this these sorts of topics. Um, I I've got to know someone, a guy on LinkedIn who um, actually came on the podcast quite early on, and I, it was it was the one it was one of the ones where it made me really uncomfortable. Um, some of his views because I I kind of saw my role as I'm just a facilitator of this. I don't you know and having to listen to him share some views that I kind of made, made me go, oh no, what's happening? I don't like yeah. this. Um, but then ho holding on to that and just going, right, okay, let's let's have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure, I hope he won't mind me saying, but 
because it, it sounds condescending, but I, I don't mean it to be that way, mm. to see how he's evolved by engaging more and, you know, educating himself and reading more and how his views have kind of amended, I would say, yeah. uh, has been great. And it's the, it's that power. The One of the things that worried me a little bit, less so now, but last year, was dialogue seems to be missing. You know, it's kind of, if you watch Question Time now versus Question Time a few years ago, yeah. they're, they're, they can be quite different. What do you, are you optimistic about the future? If you're still active, yeah. how do you feel about when you encounter people? There seems to be so many divisive subjects at the moment. Yeah. So it is, I think people have become more kind of, this is where I am and this is where I stand. And that, happened I think because of we had we had Brexit Trump. we had although <laughs> we're not Americans we had Trump yeah. um and and the impact of I guess his style on on media I think social media is also has hasn't had had an impact because we get presented with things that we believe rather than a kind of this is a full view so you almost have to go out and actively seek other opinions because all of your social media knows what you believe and they would just give you, present you with the same information. And so I actually think it has got harder, but I'm hopeful, I guess, because I work with young people um, mm. and also just because I'm that kind of person, I'm hopeful that we will get to a point where the problems get so big, we have to just stop and go, okay, we can't continue along the same route of just Labour and Tory and that's it. Yeah or either the Democrats or, and the Republicans in America, mm. we actually have to be in a place where we have coalitions like they do across the rest of the U Europe quite happily. And they seem to function um, because it just, it isn't working. So that's mm. what makes me positive. The fact that what's happening with the planet is happening and we're now talking about it a lot more. You know, unfortunately we had what happened with George Floyd happen and we're yeah. talking about race a lot more. Um, but also, I think we're also talking about just inclusion and and diversity in a better way because it's not it's not just about race. It's about gender. It's about class. It's about poverty. It's about so many things. It's about um, just you know how your brain works and introverts versus extroverts and having all of those people in the room. That is what's going to change things. So I think as we become clearer that those things all matter things will get better. I have to be, because if you if you don't believe it's going to change, life just, what's the, what's the point? You then you don't just start living for yeah. yourself, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and I can't, I couldn't, I can't live my life that way. I have to believe that we, we are, we are getting better. I definitely can see better, I guess, um, you know, when you, when you look at the, the conversation that's happening, that's probably the best word. Like there is a lot more diversity inclusion there's a lot more conversation about the planet it's not as good as it should be but I definitely think we're better than where we were a few years ago yeah 100 percent agree 100 yeah. percent agree it's um <laughs> really, I, really, I will come back to customer experience and, I know, right? <laughs> and, and contact centers but I think these are such important um important topics and again it's that I've loved how the disruption that's come out of, um, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter or um, Greta and climate change, how, you know, in my in the uh, in the other hat that I wear as being one of the leadership team um, for BPA quality, so quality uh, monitoring in contact yeah. centres, we have uh, predominantly young. There's we've got people from forty three different nations. Mm -hmm um it's it's wonderful i love it it's very diverse yeah. but them and i i would i would have thought before we're a very welcoming and we communicate well but what's been great is actually having our people say what is the company view on what happened to george floyd mm -hmm. uh, floyd yeah. what is the company view on what are we doing about the climate what no, and you can't just say, oh, we've put energy saving light bulbs in. Yeah. They, they they want to know what is your position? And our company president, uh, even though he's from the UK, now lives in America, mm -hmm. him and his wife, who's our CEO, wrote uh, a letter to everyone saying, 
um, their view on racism and how we can how we need to do more as a company because I think like a lot of companies where we have an extremely diverse team and it's diverse up to a certain point yeah and and then you go well actually most of the leadership team are like me mm -hmm. so yeah. what are we going to do about it you know because we need to do we need to do something mm -hmm. about it and I think that's where a hell of a lot of companies find themselves yeah and I think what's great is that your team were, 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 were like, okay, we want to have this conversation. And, and your leadership team responded in the right way. You know, for me, it's about recognizing where you are, because as you say, there were so many people that so many companies where, oh, we are really diverse. But then you hit the senior leadership leadership team and you're like, oh, okay, suddenly those demographics are really changing yeah. quite Most of us are called John. You know, and what can we do about it? And it starts at understanding the numbers and like anything, setting uh, goals for yourself as a business. Okay, so if we're recruiting this role, what agencies can we use to find women, to find people of colour, to find mm. people who are neurodiverse? You know, what mm. can we do to, to bring those people in the business and make it a real focus and make sure that you're, they're a part of your shortlist? There's no point just talking about it if you're not going to target people. So, uh, I mean, at Depop, I, I know that our um, our people partners are, are sort of actively on LinkedIn, finding people who who will bring something different to Depop, you know, yeah. who bring diversity to Depop. And it's, so, yeah, it feels, for me, it's really, it's a special thing to be a part of. So we have, we ha I had some inclusion training a few weeks ago, and we were talking about what makes it special. And as someone who's worked in London for, you know, nearly 20 years, I was like, I was seeing the same things you were. So you'd have quite diverse actual agent teams, maybe your team mm. leaders, but actually once you got above that, it was people who looked and sounded the same. Mm. Um, and actually at Depop, what you find, and we describe, I described it in the training, like it's like a London bus. So there's voices and accents from everywhere. Yeah. So I go to work and it's, it's people from Africa, Asia, all parts of Europe. And I just, I love that. I feel like- yeah. I feel like we are representing the community. If I was working in the wilds of Scotland, I wouldn't expect it to be like that, right? But if I'm in London, it's a reasonable thing for me to kind of come to work and expect to experience. And it's just, it's the best thing. Just, it feels really good to be a part of a place that doesn't just talk about something. We live it. We live it every day. Mm. And it's just really lovely. But yeah, for me, I'm loving the fact that so many businesses are having this conversation. And I'm not saying it's perfect. We we still have lots to do at Depop on, on that front. But so many organizations are moving in the right direction. And it didn't, we didn't get here to where we are in a few years. So we're not going to change it all in a few years. But as long as businesses are taking small steps towards these goals, I feel like we can achieve it. I love that. Let's um let's talk about your it's it's been evident but let's talk about the kind of the passion for people and how that manifests itself in how you kind of how you set up the teams yeah. how you how you lead them so i mean th there are kind of core fundamentals to me so like right people in the roles so i'm really thorough with recruitment because i've had bad experiences with you know people who were you know sometimes plucked from within the team because they were great at a and we want to reward that person for excellence at A, but we then try and fit them into the B job. So I avoid things like that. For me, it's about, right, what is the requirement? What do, what do we need from, from the role? What sort of person would be a great fit? And then creating a recruitment process that supports that. Um, really thorough induction, really clear roles that give, this is what the big outcomes are that I want from you, but what are you gonna bring as a person? So I think there are real fundamentals to knowing who you are that help you to do the best job you can so you know if you are a team leader yes it's about I must I know what the quality is I know what numbers they did yesterday all of this good stuff but also how are they feeling you know so what the, what what is your person going through today have you had a bit of a quick check-in via slack or zoom or whatever you use can you tell when they're having a difficult time one of the things that I find is that we have, and I know that everybody in CX is going through this, there's a lot of mental health issues, um, just kind of everywhere, really. Mm. Um, and one of the decisions I took last year is that we 
we're going to be in a place where we we know how everybody's feeling so my friday team meeting which i have with both my direct reports and my wider team we we talk about right how the week has gone with our sort of okrs and all of that sort of stuff and um, then we talk about what our barriers are so what got in your way and it could be something at work or it could be something outside of work we're going to talk it out um, and then we do our wins of the week so what was the thing that you did that you really want to celebrate because a lot of the time people don't stop to do that. Uh, we go straight of, past them, don't like, we? We're just doing, mm. and in CX, you can do that, right? You can just come yeah. in and do your 50 tickets if you're an agent, <laughs> or go through all of your one-to-ones and your check-ins this week if you're a team lead. You can get quite, I'm just going to get it done, and not stop to go, mm. what did I do that was really great? How did I turn someone, stay around if I'm an agent? What process did I, what process change did I suggest that has been signed off that's going to get implemented? Stop and recognize that. And then the final thing is the learning of the week, because my probably my biggest learning as a sort of a leader and a manager over the years has been actually stop and figure out what didn't go so well and what I can do about it and do that frequently. Because Mm. if you do that, when the big things go wrong and when they, you know, and they will, because none of us are perfect in our roles, right? You will just, you'd be like, okay, it's just, it's another thing that's gone wrong. What can I learn? What can I do differently? Who could I have talked to? Like, what other teams did I need to get involved? It really helps you to think differently. And so every every week I'm doing that with all of my team. So not just people who are leaders, but also just the people doing the day to day so that they can start thinking about the organization and themselves really differently. And I think if you embed that in people at all levels, it makes progression easier. It makes development easier. It makes growth easier. People are more, they enjoy their jobs more because they're reflecting all the time on what's gone well and what's not, what can they learn from? Um, and so that's probably, you know, one of my core fundamentals for how I manage my team on a weekly basis. And then there's bigger things like how many QA are you checking a week? What do you, as, as QA, you know, it's not just about the numbers. It's what was the coaching session like with that person when you, when you, when you spoke to them? What were the small actions that they took away? How are we making that measurable? Because it's contact centers. You have to measure your success, right? It's not just about the, the people stuff. Um and so, yeah, I, I have the core fundamentals, but the bit that really, the bits that I love are the bits that help people to understand what they're bringing to the table every day, what great work looks like for them, and make sure that they're talking about it and measuring all the time so that when they get to the end of the year review that they can sing and they can be like, I did this, you know, and confidently say that because so much of, I think who people, you know, a lot of people are, they, they you know, you talked about self-reflection earlier, you need to know what you're doing really well, but you also need to know what's not going well so you can do something about it. And also sometimes decide if you wanna do something about it. Because yeah. I'm mean, using myself as an example, yes, I could do the financials. I could, you know, I've been doing P&Ls as an account manager when I was like in my mid twenties. Yeah. You know, I, I could do that stuff, but I don't love it. It does not get me excited. What gets me yeah. excited is showing someone what their best selves look like, helping them to get to that place and watching them grow and kind of having that conversation in January and then watching the other, that person come out the end and go for another role, leave the business if they have to and find the thing that's right for them. That gets me really excited. And I feel like teaching people that sort of self-reflection piece of knowing who you are so that they can spot opportunities, grow towards the opportunities. That's the best way for me to lead. You know, I don't, I'm not an agent. I'm not handling X number of tickets a day. So I'm never going to be the person who designs the perfect process. They will help us do that. Right. But what my bit is, is empowering them, putting the sort of tools in place and processes in place that they feel like they can flag that and making sure we've got a process to log it and have teams from the product team and our tech teams and engineers look at it and go, you know what, that's a good idea. We can't do it now because we've got these many jobs, but we can do it in a few months time and making sure that agent gets that feedback and knowing that they've been a part of of that change. That's where I come in because, you know, they can't just jump off their laptop and just walk over to engineering because we're all in different parts of the country (laughs) now, right? Um, It's not like the old days where you could go over to IT and go over to the program and have a chat. (laughs) Um, we're working in a really different environment, which has, for me, created its own challenges. So I I really struggled when I joined Depop because I came in with my, 
I mean, one of my team called said, he said to me, you know, it's Andrea, you know, people is your superpower. So I can imagine, he said, I can imagine that you're really like having a tough time because you've come in and you can't just walk into the room and be you. You have to slap 20 different people and be you, Um, which takes a lot of energy. And and so you, you have to find different ways of doing it because you can't just walk up to someone's desk and check in with them every day. You've got to, to check in on Slack or create a weekly meeting or a bi-weekly meeting that just has a different type of conversation. So I get into the nitty gritty of feelings and it's it's like, it's a bit crazy. So one of my, one of my, um, she, she's not a direct report of mine, but um, she says sometimes our team meeting is like therapy. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and I love that. I, I know yeah. it's, it's a bit, it's, some people go, what? You know, what kind of no, reason? But for me, somebody walking out and feeling like they've got something off their chest, they're feeling better. That's a really, that's a good thing to create in any work environment. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy that um, uh, works, I would say for me, but it feels like it's with me. Yeah. We, we often say the same thing, but it goes both ways, you know. So I, I feel better after speaking to him. Mm. and he because he's he mentioned the same thing saying it's like therapy chatting to you every um every day yeah. and I said I I I don't mind I'm 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 a hundred percent in in your camp yeah. there's so many things there that I was just like a nodding dog thinking I love this you know if you go right back to one of the first things you said then around um how clear you are on recruitment mm. so I because I can remember the days and I'm sure you can where like if you were the best salesperson you had a better chance of becoming a team leader and they were absolutely sometimes the worst leaders possible because <laughs> they had yeah. they didn't care about anyone else um yeah. and equally being an outsourcer like you were I was the same as a team leader I would openly say to people if you think I'm going to be the font of all knowledge on our 15 different clients mm. You, you've got the wrong team leader because I'm here to help you and make you a better, sorry, puppy is just eating the drawers. Um, um, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to be a knowledge base. You know, I can help, but I, it's more about, I would always say the widget, whatever it is, whether it's a service or a product, isn't the important thing. The important thing is the customer at the end, but you as an employee and how you are and how you're kind of showing up today how can I help you and I I'm a bit evangelical about this I have been for for years about um you mentioned something there about you can do 50 tickets you can do something I would never want anywhere where I've worked to be like a consequence free environment you could have had the best day ever but you either walk out if you're in a physical building or just log off and your team leader or, or no one has recognized that and gone yeah. hey you did great today yeah. that kind of what otherwise what's the point yeah you know and that just kind of um being able to check in with people mm-hmm. and and things like that that for me is um is true leadership and I love your point about because someone said it to me before saying you know you could go on an excel course because I'm terrible mm-hmm. and I said less or we could use someone who's passionate about excel in the same way that i'm passionate about not doing it (laughs) Uh, and and talking talking to talking to people and hoping to make them better um and the final thing i'm just going through like a tick list i'm like you're so much good stuff you're saying um you know this one of the things you're right that i think we miss generally you don't but we miss generally that you mentioned is stopping to debrief rather you know regardless of the outcome it could be a win or a loss but we don't do enough debriefing to say what happened Mm -hmm. you know and um there's this book called flawless execution and it's written by ex us um air force pilots and the single biggest thing that was drilled into them is after every mission Mm. even more important than planning before was debriefing afterwards mm. and just going through stuff and saying right like you say what what went well what didn't go well mm. how did it feel tell me about the what would you do differently mm. because we're so committed to the treadmill we're just on 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 mm. it's difficult sometimes isn't it to go well let's just take a moment and think about things yeah 
And we only ever do that. I mean, in, and most organizations, you do a big lessons learned when something's gone horribly wrong. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, the app's gone down for a day. You know, that marketing code didn't work for three hours and no one noticed all that kind of stuff. Then you go, but you, you need to do it on the smaller things too. And if it's just mm. a part of who you are as a team, it can really help people to grow. Um, yeah, and I think I, I, I do that because I know the impact it's had on me to just be more reflective, be more, because even, even in learning, all your, your, you're calling it that, yes, something went wrong, but I'm taking a learning away from this, which will make me a better manager, a better agent, whatever role I'm in, I'm going to make this small step. And I'm, I'm, I'm big on small steps. You know, like, you know, we all need to be moving in direction incrementally. It's just a lot easier when you do it that way. Just be constantly moving in the direction that you want to be. What do you do from a training point of view? Uh, oh, no, sorry, I've got... I remember before I forget, mm -hmm. you talked about that you have um, structure and support for your agent's kind of mental health. And I think yeah. we all recognize that being on the phones or um, dealing with customers, you're like a sponge. You just go through the entire, mm -hmm. the entire day just soaking up whatever energy is coming across to you, right? Um, so I'm really interested, what, what is it that you have in place? So within the actual team, so we've got mental health um, first aiders who they can jump on with. We actually have a partnership with an organisation where they can just jump in and just have a chat specifically around their mental health and how they're feeling. So if they don't want to speak to someone in Depop, there's an outside provider. We also give people access to free counselling sessions. Um, so there are different things right. that, that they that they can take as steps or they can just kind of jump into Slack and just talk to other people about what's happened on that contact. So the thing to mention um, is that the agents handle quite a lot of abuse. So what you'll find unfortunately with young people is that they just don't always understand the consequences of their actions. So, you know, and, and a contact that began around purchasing the product can turn into bullying and harassment. So and, and body shaming and all of this sort of stuff. So the agents have to be trained to deal with that. We also, you know, like, and I see, I have seen this in other contact centers too, where people can threaten suicide and stuff if things haven't gone a certain way. And um, so, yeah, we've really had to work with, with other providers, you know, like the Samaritans um, mm -hmm. to put structures in place to give people support because yes, there is so much, you know, you can try your best as a manager, but sometimes you do need a professional to have a, a conversation with somebody if it's been particularly um, difficult um but yeah it's it's been I probably would say one of my biggest challenges coming from normal CX environments where it's just about monetary compensation I would say or writing or saying your apology in the right way which I think is equally um as important as as, as how much you compensate someone um has for, for me at Depos has has been that element of of dealing with online abuse online harm understanding what that looks like for younger people understanding that what a 40 year old would think is just you know brush off yeah. the shoulders yeah for a, for a 14 year old can be quite a traumatic thing and teaching agents to to recognize the language that a young person would use if they're not a young person themselves and what what trauma can look like and sound like on on email because my team doesn't handle any um any phone contact so there's no voice it's just in writing so they they will you have to go through lots of of, of teaching them to firstly understand what it looks like what can how, what how do you frame a response how do you show real empathy what tools because we also have other websites that we refer people to because they're never going to be experts on whatever the thing is right where can we send them to get support and yeah. then if you've had a really bad time handling that what do, what, do, what do we do for you so there's like there's a threefold understand the issue respond appropriately giving that user who's been through the abuse the right support but also what do you need to do for yourself if it's if it's really pushed you in the wrong direction there's a whole it's, there's a whole kind of there's probably another podcast all by itself just in communication through words right mm -hmm. rather than rather than voice and the whole um and you are you have the added uh complexity of like the kind of generational changes yeah and and then the implications of that is it must be tough but it's fascinating mm -hmm. it's I find that kind of thing absolutely fascinating yeah I've, I've I've been really fortunate here in that I've had the opportunity to grow and learn so so many new things um versus what I did before 
because it's a marketplace environment. So yes, you're dealing with my parcel didn't arrive, but you're also dealing with, with com complex issues about how people are feeling, which mm. connects with who I am as a person. So that's great, but it's also how do you train people to deal with that? What support structure do you, you put in place to help? Um, and it's just not something that I ever had to, to think about or, or worry about. So that's been, been great for me. I bet you've loved that though, haven't you? Yeah, like, so I'm, I'm a real growing perp. So my, my big things are, you know, I'm, I'm a positive person in the room, right? really annoyingly sometimes, but I'm also <laughs> the person who will force us all to reflect and to learn from what's happened. And so, you know, being in a place where I can grow has been great for my mental well-being. I, I've lived alone through lockdown. Um, I have a lovely love job, but she decided she was going to stay at her boyfriend's for, for lockdown. So I spent pretty much all of it by myself. And so I'm quite grateful to have, have had the opportunity to join Depop and be in a place where I could be doing things that challenged my brain. So I didn't think about the fact that I wasn't going to see anybody for ages. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, prior to be, so I'm recently remarried, but I had, I would say six years. It was just kind of like me and a cat. And, um, wow. but weirdly, it, it's, it's an experience like that makes you understand the difference between being alone and loneliness yeah you know because there's a there's a there's a big there's a big difference and actually now this the adjustment to having a very busy house again mm -hmm. and that kind of you'd be, you could spend a lot of time inside your own head but that's not necessarily negative no yeah because you're I mean like you you're doing things with your brain that really matter you know, mm. so, you know, I've been a super fan for a long time and, and you know this. So, you know, you live a very full life, but it's full of things that really matter to you and you do impactful work. So I can imagine your brain is busy, but with all sorts of good stuff rather than being busy with, you know, I'm unhappy or worry. And we all get worries, but there's a you can generally tell when people are living their lives in a, in a purposeful direction. And I do sense that with you. I, well, I, I think we're kindred spirits because it's that, um, I like an acronym and there was one that I remember that it's about this kind of thing you mentioned about marginal gains, right? So every day you should be, it should be about progression, but, and you should enjoy just the process of progression rather than their thinking there's an end result. So it's not about, oh, if I get the car, the house, the job, all of a sudden I'm happy at that point. Yeah. because it doesn't that doesn't happen but it's cool it was called build mm. and it means that every day you work on uh, b is for body you so like health or okay. you know um you is you so yeah. it's more about your you want to learn something read something i is income l is love so a relationship with someone and d is development so that's kind of more as opposed to you which is your own self-awareness yeah. L uh, D is learning something like training yourself to to do something and that every day you would like do a little journal mm -hmm. and just write next to it what you would be what you did the previous day against yeah. all of these things okay and it and it's not about completing them necessarily it's more about okay I haven't spent any time on you mm -hmm. for the last three days yeah I need to I need to factor that in it's just a quite like that um I just felt the need to share it. No, no, randomly. I love that. Like, because it's helping you to reflect, focus on the right things, do lots of growing and learning. But yeah, I've haven't heard about that one. Build. It's a good. Approach. You, I, I imagine you're the kind of person who it's important to you. You mentioned before this kind of. Um, I would see you as a as a role model. Mm -hmm. So this kind of looking out for people mentoring them taking an interest you'll gravitate towards people what what do you do um at depop around around that do you do mentoring and so i've currently got two people that i mentor one that i just kind of took upon myself um and one that the business asked me to, <laughs> <laughs> um, and one that the business asked me to mentor and i do i live my life that way so i'm i'm that person everyone's my, my friends come to me for stuff and we just talk through it so I'm working on telling people less what to do um, and, and working on just talking through what's happened, why are we here, you know, where do you want to go, 
and helping people to, to get to that place. Depop's developing a, a mentoring program at the moment, but yeah, I've got two people that I mentor and I just, I feel, but I, that there's two formally happening, but I, I actively, when I have, cause I have, I have one-to-ones with my peers um, every other week. And I frame those conversations around that same style of let's just talk through things. Um, because I just feel like it's in our roles in CX, you can get stuck into the numbers. You can get stuck in, stuck into, right, what's the variance versus the previous week? What action are we going to take? And not stopping to talk about how someone's feeling about a conversation that they've had that's gone wrong. Or they were in a meeting, they wanted to say something and they didn't have the confidence to do it. Why? Although you'd go, oh, that's not as important as that not spotting the variance or not talking about it. it is because people are in meetings for a reason they should feel comfortable to to share their point of view if they can't do that you know how can we how can we support people to feel like they can speak up and speak out um and it's something that I really struggled with it struggled with before and I've learned lots of hints and tips about kind of ways to get over it so I try and coach people through that now who I can see it happening to um if someone's more senior to me and I can see that I potentially think that the way that delivering feedback to someone isn't delivering the right result I'm in a place now where I will confidently go you know what you did a b and c this is how it appeared to make that person feel you know if you did it differently next time what would you do and Yes, people don't always appreciate that in the moment, but the vast majority of the time they'll come back to me and go, you know, thank you for that. And this is what I'm going to do differently because I do, I'm quite aware of how people feel. I don't, I don't know if I'm expressing this the right way, but I can, yeah, you know, yeah. I will be the person in the room who observes that maybe someone hasn't spoken or mm. maybe they did speak and they felt like they got cut down or they're just not themselves. I will try and take that away and do something with it because. I guess I, I'm in a place a lot of the time where I enjoy being at work and I want other people to, to, to have the same experience. And I know that, you know, like the world isn't perfect. You know, we're not going to love our day-to-day -day job, but you should be in a place where you can come into work, feel comfortable to speak, you know, get feedback and take it constructively and all of this sort of stuff that, that matters to your mental well-being. that matters to how you feel at work. So I, I'm actively like doing that piece of, I've spotted something. I'm going to talk to someone about it and try and make a positive change for for the person um, in that moment or or after if I can. What you verbalised there, for some reason, I think it's somehow getting a bit of negative connotations. I don't know why. Maybe it's just overuse. But what you verbalised there is, for me, like the epitome of work should be a safe space. This what what is a safe space? It is somewhere where you can just be yourself, be comfortable make mistakes, have open conversations, develop all of those sorts of things. What you've just described to me is exactly that, that you're at your, you don't have to love work or all the time, but you should be able to know, well, you absolutely as a fundamental must know it's safe, yeah. regardless of our differences, who you are, all of those kind of things. Yeah. Absolutely love it. And whilst you said you didn't think you um, expressed it well, for me, the way you described that being able to read a room mm -hmm. is how I, if someone said to me, what is emotional intelligence? That's mm -hmm. kind of where I would go to is that kind of you're being aware of uh, other people, how the, the dynamic and how the conversation is going. And maybe what are those indicators telling you about where people are at? You know, mm -hmm. maybe like you say, maybe someone hasn't spoken doesn't feel comfortable mm. to be able to check in and coax that out of them that's emotional intelligence isn't it yeah. yeah figure out why what's getting in their way is it confidence is it you know it's a zoom fear because loads of people have that they'll be fine in a, like a meeting room but you put them behind as a camera and it's, it's it's different um or you get the people who just don't trust themselves so they overthink any, everything and they don't want to speak and just helping them to, to work on whatever their issue is so that the next meeting it gets a bit better and the meeting after that and in 10 meetings time they're the life and soul of the party you know yeah like, you know and some people will never get there because that's just not who they are they are the type mm -hmm. of person who needs to go read the doc and feedback on email you know yeah. we, do, we do you do need those people in the team too yeah completely 
but it is about understanding who they are so that you know when something's changing you can support them through whatever it is as we co- as we sort of come to the end of the year um for you personally and for depop so two parts yeah what what excites you the most about next year um so for depop we're doing a lot of work around upskilling we've got an outsource partnership um and we really want to upskill that team to deal with more complex queries because we've been with them for about 18 months and they've shown us that they can do great work and we're like okay we're going to send them some more challenging they stuff more. we actually <laughs> we actually find that we are getting more of the difficult queries than we thought we would do mm. so just giving them the, the the tools they need to have the emotional intelligence to use the words that you've just used to handle the more complex queries um and Depop as, a, as an overall business is planning quite a lot of work around people and culture that I'm involved in, because like I, I said, I don't know if I, I mentioned this before we put the um, the mics on, but um, and started recording, but we've grown so much over this yeah. period. It's like, how do we rebuild that culture that we used to have in the tiny building in Curtain Road and Shoreditch um, into the awesome space that we have in Farringdon with the you know, I think we're probably at about um, 60%, 70% of the business was, was recruited remotely. How do you create a space that people want to come back into? Or actually, if they've never worked in the building, create a space where people want to come in and, and how we how we make that happen. So those are the two things that I'm really excited about. Um, creating, you know, upskilling the outsource team, but also creating a space um, in Depop that people love working in as much as I do. What are your um, thoughts on that, just in, because I think that's a challenge, like we've, we've had growth as well, and we've hired loads of people that have never physically met anyone, um, yeah. and that whole, because you can, the, you can theorise and say, we'll make it a great space, okay, that it, it'll be colourful and, in, you know, conducive to nice conversations, and we'll have lots of nice breakout areas and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that uh, for me that only has like a, that's a, a, there's a once a novelty wears off yeah. it's not necessarily about that is it mm. so so for me it's about so we do have this amazing space so it's for me it's about addressing the barriers that people are facing so for some people it's safety so we are going to be doing um especially over this period a bit more testing so people feel more comfortable coming in so people test before they come in it's about managers creating an experience when people come into work so you know the day that you're in the office or the two days you're in the office you're having workshop based meetings with your team so that you're doing stuff together not just everybody in different offices still on zoom you know you you have to create reasons for people to come to want to come into that physical space um, and then I think the other element for me is about working with managers more closely to understand how they're communicating within their team so they create a culture where people want to be in the yeah. office together so I get when when me and my team are in we're all kind of sat on pods like near each other so we can not shout but you know we can talk yeah, yeah. I, I love that you know and yeah. sometimes I think we had this moment a few weeks ago where we were all just tapping away and I just stopped and I was like this is just the best feeling we're not we're not like yeah talking to each other but we were yeah. just they were there and just having that energy from people and I think the more you you make it a positive experience you make it worth the train journey you know you make it yeah. worth them giving up their morning yoga if they've got to do that you know um yeah I think it's about making it worth coming in creating a really positive experience um a really human experience that makes people want to come in um and then the second bit of your question about what I'm looking forward yeah. to. So like I mentioned a bit earlier, I've recently started um, volunteering as a board trustee with the domestic violence charity. I'm, I'm looking forward to really growing that part of myself. So, you know, I, I've always, I work in roles where I'm really impactful on the ground. I'm talking to teams, I'm getting that work done. I want to be in a place where I'm sort of stepping away and being more strategic in my thinking. Mm. And, and, and the role with the domestic violence charity allows me to do that. Um, so yeah, that's the thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to most. And hopefully just less COVID rules. I want to do some, some traveling and just spend more time with people in, in 
um in close places like gigs and stuff I miss music I yeah. miss being able to get onto a dance floor and completely relax and not have to worry and not have other people feel worried because it's mm. it's about um how people are feeling so yeah I'm I'm positive about lots of things for next year I applaud that and I've, I've absolutely loved uh this this conversation today um I know I probably I think I say it too often but I definitely love to um, do another one mm -hmm. another few maybe and just yeah. maybe kind of focus in on a particular a topic well cool. that's the theory I'm sure we'll, <laughs> I'm sure we'll go go all over the place yeah. but I've I've thanks so much for uh coming on I've definitely right. learned something it's been a pleasure to chat to you today yeah it's been great to chat to you too have a good rest of the day and thank you thank you for making this podcast like <laughs> I'll bore you with the details later but you you know you I get so much learning and so many great hints and tips from this podcast and I share it with so many people because it's just so many lovely little nuggets that people can take away every week and I think that's what's great about it and then there's you and the energy that you bring to it like I've been having a conversation that you know some people would do in an interview but you've made it so relaxed and so easy so yeah thank you thank you very much and everyone's going to get hundreds of nuggets from your one so <laughs> just hang <Cool>. on <laughs> all right take care have a good day